Hey guys, Tyler here taking another step on the journey to Master Programmer. Today, I'm going to be going over the second part of week one in the NAND to Tetris course. There's not much to cover. We have multi-bit buses and then the project one specification. So I'll start with multi-bit buses. Now, normally we're dealing with, let's say an A and a B. A and B can be either zero or one, zero or one. Well, the multi-bit bus, let's say C with a bracket of eight, is going to have eight different slots that each slot can have a zero or one value. So as you can see, we have eight slots here. Now, each one can only be a zero or a one. So if the slot at number one was a one, then you would have a one. If the slot at number two was a zero, then you'd have a zero, and all the way down. So then you would have a single line of different values that could be whatever you needed them to be. One thing to note with a bus is that the first is indexed zero. The second bit is indexed one. So you do have to go from zero to one and you should get used to thinking of an order of things being from zero to the length of the order minus one. So there's eight here. The last one is going to be seven because that's eight minus one. That's just the way it's going to be in many programming concepts. So just zero based, it gets easier as you go along with it. Another concept in the buses that we're gonna be using with the HDL provided with the course is that they are right aligned. So if you had a D of three, this one right here is going to be number zero. This one right here is going to be number one. And this one right here is going to be number two. So you have to think a little bit backwards, but of course, once you do it for a little while, you'll get used to it. Now, the reason why this is important right here is because you can specify each of the slots from a bus by saying D2. And this means that you're referencing this slot. Now the difference between this D2 and this D3 is you'll use it in a scenario like this. So you'll say in, of course that's the uh, keyword, and then you'll say D3. And now you have an in, which requires three bits for its bus. And then when you are just talking about a specific slot, you'll just use D and then the brackets and then the slot that you want. In some cases, you might want to specify more than just one sort of slot. So with that, you can specify, say, zero dot dot to two. Now this says that you're gonna get everything between slot zero and slot two. So right now this will just include slot one, but if you had, say, for C8, you could say C zero dot dot uh, seven, and that's gonna include all of them. Or instead of seven, you could say four, and that's gonna include the first five because starting from zero to four, that's going to be zero, one, two, three, and four, which is five slots. I think that covers most of the concepts with multi-bit buses. However, I don't have it 100% understood. I haven't been able to work with it yet in any chipsets, but I'm sure that as I and you go along, it'll become secondhand. Now that we know about multi-bit buses, we can go into the specification of the project one for project one we are given nand nand is just given to us we don't have to worry about how it's made we just need to worry about what it can do using nand we're going to have to build many chipsets these are the chipsets that we have to make in project one using just nand and the previous chipsets that we make so once we make a not and an or we can use those in the following chipsets that we have to create. These chipsets are known as the elementary logic gates. They're pretty much the simplest, though do not get that confused with an elementary chipset and a composite chipset because XOR, MUX, and DMUX are going to be using these chipsets. This set of chipsets are known as the 16-bit variants. I'm sure you can imagine, based off of what I just talked about with multi-bit buses and their names, they're basically going to do the same functionality, but utilizing multi-bit buses to, to take care of more than one bit at a time. This set of chipsets is known as the multi-way variants. 
So again, they're going to be a little bit more complicated and I'll go over them in the project one. But now we know exactly what we need to implement this set of chipsets. While I'm going to go over each and every one of these chipsets in the project one video, which will be next, I want to go over how I'm going to reach these conclusions. Now this took me a little bit to learn. I had to go back and get my Boolean identity sheet and refresh myself a little bit on canonical Boolean functions. But once I got through this, it actually made a lot of sense of how I'm going to achieve each of these chipsets. So I'm going to give you a quick notation. Normally I would write say X and Y, but that takes a lot of time. So instead we can do a more simpler form of X right next to a Y. Now this just means X and Y. Similarly, instead of X or Y, we'll just write X plus Y. So two variables right next to each other just means and, and two variables with a plus in between them means or. For not, we'll just have the variable with a dash above it. Now to show my process for each of the chipsets that I'll be doing in project one, I'm going to go through mux right now and show exactly how I solved it. Here is the truth table from mux. We have the A input, the B input, the S input, and the R result. S is the selector, A and B are just the normal inputs. Now I'm going to create the function that gives you a one in this scenario and only this scenario. And I'm going to do that for each case that result is equal to one. So here we have the function that results in a one in only this case, not A, and B and S. I'm going to do that for the rest of them. There we go. Hopefully you got the same thing if you came up with it on your own or at least makes sense to you. Now I'm going to OR them all together. So I'll just add a plus after that one, that one, and that one. I'm going to rewrite it up here. All right, there we go. Now we're going to be kind of reverse engineering this because this function is the canonical function. This perfectly describes this table. However, it's really big, really bulky, and the way we're going to implement it using chips doesn't really jump out at me from this. The tools I'm going to be using to turn this complicated function into a simple function is the Boolean identities. So of course you have your commutative laws, which X and Y is the same as Y and X. We covered that in the last video. We're also going to have associative laws. So X and Y and Z is the same as Z and X and Y. Then there's the distributed laws. So X and parentheses Y or Z is the same as parentheses X and Y and parentheses or the parentheses X and Z. So you should have a list of this. I mean, it's easy to find online or if you're following along in the NAND to Tetris course, you probably already wrote it down. There's a couple more that the NAND to Tetris course didn't cover. So I'm gonna, I'll write those down right here. Okay, so the first one we have is A and A equals A. You can think of this it's simple. If a is going to be equal to zero, then a and a is just zero and zero, which is zero. And if a is equal to one, then it's just one and one equals to one. This works for or as well. The next identity we have is not a and a. This is always going to be equal to false. The reason for this is if a is zero, this part will work, but this part will fail. And if a is one, this part will fail and this part will work. So that'll always be false. Instead, in the third identity I listed here, you have not A or A, it's always going to be true. Because if you have one, then this will fail, but that'll work, and it's just or, so that succeeds. Or if you have a zero, then this one works, and then that one fails, and that just because one works and it's in an or, it's true. Now we have all the tools we need to turn this very ugly, and complicated function into a very simple function. It took me a little while to figure out how to do this because I did it first for mux, but I'll explain my thought process to you. The first thing you have to look for is anywhere in any of these ors, these sort of segments that are surrounded by ors, anything that is similar. So right here, I see an a, an a, and an a. Using the distributive law, I can actually pull that a out. Now, as you can see, this ABS just went straight down. The A came out of each and every one of these terms and is now on the outside of the parentheses, 
you can think of it as it's just like regular integer distribution. You have the a, it technically belongs to each one of these terms, however we're keeping it over here. Already this is a little bit more simpler, but we can go much, much further. We're going to use the distributive property again for these terms in here. You have b naught and s naught, or b and s naught. This s naught is in both of them, so we can pull that out. There we go. Now, if you notice, you have b naught or b. If you look over here in this identity list, a naught or a is always going to be equal to true. So this right here is always going to be equal to true. Because this is always going to be equal to true, it simplifies by just leaving. Because you have not s and true, the only thing you have to worry about is the not s, because it's the only one that will affect the and. Now at first when I did that cancellation, I thought I had achieved the most minimal function. However, you can go even further. What I did is I redistributed this a into these two terms. There we go, I've distributed this a into the not s and the bs. Now, you, as you can see, there's a bs here and a bs here. I can take that bs out just like that. The as came down because it was unaffected by that distributive identity. And now in here, you have not a or a. We know that right there, that's always going to be true. So the only determining factor is bs plus a s naught. And this is actually as far as I could get it down to. Now, if you look at this for a second, something will jump out at you. The answer will bite you in the face. Mux is defined as if the selector is zero, then you get the value of a. If the selector is one, then you get the value of b. That's actually very succinctly stated in this function. However, it didn't jump out at me when I read the definition of MUX. I had to go through this process, and I think that I'll probably have to go through this process for all of the chipsets. However, I hope you were able to follow along with that and see how you can go from a truth table and use the identities to get the canonical function and then turn that down all the way into a succinct function that explains perfectly what you need. And very clearly, you could turn this into a diagram, at least a lot more clear than you could turn this big old beast into a diagram. In fact, as a last part, I'll draw a diagram here. So we have our inputs A and B and our selector S. Now we know that if B and S, we're going to output true. So I'll write an AND gate here and have S go into it and B go into it. And that outputs a true. However, we also know that if A is true and S is not true, then we will output true. So I'll have another AND gate to symbolize the AND between this A and the not S. The A goes right into the AND gate. The S has to go through a not first though to symbolize the not symbol here. Once it goes through the not gate, it pipes right into there and comes out. Now to symbolize the OR between these two terms, we just write an OR gate and that feeds out our output. Now we can abstractify this whole concept. If I'm going just going to draw a big old boundary around here. This entire thing, if I was just to look at it without worrying what's inside here, that's the MUX chip. We have our inputs, we have our output. That's the interface, abstract. And if we want to worry about the implementation, we know what's inside. Let's go through it real quick. If Just to test and make sure that it makes sense. So if A is going to be equal to zero and S is equal to zero, the S comes through here. This AND gate fails because the S is 0. The S gets flipped to a 1 here. And then this AND fails because the A is a 0, which outputs a 0. That's exactly what we want because we want the A if S is 0. Just like you can see up here in the truth table, you can check S is 0 and A is 0. You get a 0. And it doesn't even matter what the B is. S is 0 and A is 0. You get a 0. Let's try a different input. Let's have B is 1 and S is one, and A is, it won't matter. So it won't matter because S gets turned into a zero at this not gate, and then it fails this AND gate. So it doesn't even matter what A is because it's going to fail here anyways. B is a one, and S is a one, which makes this AND gate work. It outputs a one, or reads that one happily and outputs a one. So let's look for all the cases where S and B are one. Here we have 
S is 1 and B is 1, we get an output of 1. And we have S is 1 and B is 1, and we get an output of 1. You can check for every possible input value that you'll get the correct output value in this chipset. That tells you that it's correct. Now, of course, it'll be easier to test it using the hardware simulator, but I'll leave that up to you. And that's all I have for this video. I'm going to be using the same process that you just saw for each of the chipsets for Project 1, which will be in the next video. Hopefully you're able to follow along. If you're confused at all still by how I reached a diagram from a truth table or how I did anything with a canonical function and turning it down into the minimal function, go ahead and leave a comment below and I'll help you out. Thank you for watching and happy journey.